Praise the Lord. We're continuing our study, and we're almost near the end of our study in Revelation. We finished chapter 19 last week, so now we're going to jump into chapter 20. So we'll give you a brief recap. Chapter 17 gave us the destruction or the judgment of the false one-world religion. Chapter 18 gave us the judgment on the economic and the commerce system of the world. And chapter 19 gave us the judgment on the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so all this is happening because Christ is now preparing us for the millennial reign, the 1,000 years of peace. How many like, would like to have that happen right now? 1,000 years of peace. But we've got to go all through all this before that happens, which means we've got to get people saved before it happens. So be praying. Before he can usher in the millennium, all the other things that we saw happen and we're going to see happen which includes the binding of Satan, has to happen before the millennial reign happens. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 says, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. So this is the very first part of Satan's judgment. It's not complete, but it's started by an angel. Angel comes down and binds him. And remember, he's not in heaven right now. He was banished from heaven. He's on earth. Angel comes down to earth, chains him up, and throws him in the bottomless pit. Now, the bottomless pit is not hell. It's a temporary holding cell until God needs him again. He's going to let him loose for a little bit at the end of the thousand years. After that, then he's tossed into hell. Now, it's not spelled out in the Bible, but a lot of people assume that this pit, this bottomless pit, is the same one described in Jude and 2 Peter. Jude 6 says, And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of the authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. This is the third of the angels that followed Satan. God kept them chained in a prison of darkness, waiting for the day of judgment. So that's kind of where they're at right now. Not all of them, but some of them. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For God did not spare even the angels when they sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy caves and darkness until judgment day. Now that word hell is not... The what we're thinking. That word is Tartarus. It's the only time it's used in the Bible. And it's used as a temporary place awaiting final judgment. So he's kind of bound up for a thousand years, or he's bound up there for a while, and God's going to finish the work. Now, verse 2 says he sees the dragon, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. Now, these are all terms that has been used in the Bible to describe the devil. He was a serpent in the garden. He was the dragon in Revelation. And when Jesus was tempted, it was the devil who tempted him. And Satan, when Jesus said, get thee behind me, he used the term Satan. So all these terms are all for the same person. And we realize that all evil in the world is directed by one individual. And that's Satan. And that one individual now is going to be cast into the bottomless pit. Verse 3 says, the angel threw him into the bottomless pit where he shut and locked, when it shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he would release, be released for a little while. So imagine all the forces of evil being gone. No, no evil coming at you, no uh, demonic temptation. The people that died in the battle of Armageddon, they're all gone. The beast and the false prophet, they're thrown in the lake of fire. The devil's bound for a thousand years, no more evil. Or at least for a thousand years, no more evil. I, I can't, you know, you think about it, how, it's ex exciting to hear, but it's kind of almost impossible to understand that there is no more evil. Now, verse four goes on and says, then I saw the thrones and people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for their testimony about Jesus, for proclaiming the word of God. And I saw the souls of those who had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Now, there's different opinions about this section. Um, the best explanation, I think, is in verse 4, it says, I saw the thrones and the people sitting on them have been giving the authority to judge. The thrones are the believers from the Old Testament and the church age, all the ones from the beginning of Genesis to the rapture. The next group that they talk about are those who were martyred during the tribulation. 
they were beheaded or killed or whatever for witnessing for Jesus. And the other group was those who refused to take the mark and were killed. So you got four different groups of people there. That last group, it says, and I saw the souls of those who were beheaded for their testimony about Jesus. Those who were witnessing and God, they were killed for that, for proclaiming the work of God. Then I saw the souls of those who had not worshipped the beast or his statue nor accepted his mark on their forehead or hands, martyred for two different reasons, one for being a witness and one for not taking the mark. And verse 5 says, this is the first resurrection. Now the Bible says there's going to be two resurrections. That was the first. And the second, in John 5, says, don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in the graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done evil will rise to eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to judgment. That's the first resurrection. The second one is for everyone who has refused Christ. Verse 5 says, the rest of the dead did not come back to life until a thousand years had ended. So do we see the timeline? At the beginning, Christians are raised. Every, everybody who is a uh, Christian or believer in the Old Testament all the way through the end of the tribulation, they're the ones that are raised and they go to what is called the uh, judgment seat of Christ. And they are judged according to not whether they're saved or not, they're judged according to what they did after they were saved. How did they serve God? How did they live their life? What things did they do to honor God? And you get rewards for that. The other group will get resurrected or raised at the end of the thousand years. And those are the folks who did not accept Christ through all ages. And verse 6 says, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign or rule with him for a thousand years. So that's pretty much every believer in all time. The second death is only for unbelievers. Now the Bible says we are blessed and we are holy. Why? Not because of what we did, but because we've trusted Christ. And the things that we do after that are not meant to determine whether we get into heaven or not. That's been decided when you came to, when you came to Christ and you accepted God's forgiveness for your sins, that's what gets you into heaven. What you do and how you live your life after that is what the Bible's talking about in the way of judgment and rewards. So the first resurrection is all the believers. And the first death is when we die physically. How many have heard the saying, born once, die twice? Born twice, die once. If you're only born physically, you have two deaths. You die physically, and you die spiritually by, by being thrown into, the, into hell. If you're born twice physically and born again, you only die physically, and you spiritually you'll be in heaven. Verse 11 goes on and says, Anyone who is willing to hear should listen to the Spirit. This is Revelation 2.11. 2, Anyone who's willing to hear should listen to the Spirit and understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. So that's all of us. Once we die physically, we're good. The Bible says God's overcome death. Aren't you glad for that? And you don't fear death anymore. You don't want it, but you don't fear it. I think I shared this on Wednesday night. Maybe it was a Sunday that I used to, before I was a Christian, I had all kinds of weird thoughts about death. I used to think, well, what if, you're, what if you die, but you can still feel what if you're conscious, but you're dead? So when they start doing the autopsy on you, maybe you can feel all that. Or when they bury you in the ground, maybe you know you're buried. But we don't have that fear anymore because we know what happens. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. So when we close our eyes here, instantly we're with Christ. So praise the Lord. And all those who have believed will now rule with Christ for that thousand years. So every Christian from the beginning of time until this point will now rule with Christ for a thousand years. Now at the end of the thousand years, verse 7 says, when the thousand years ends, Satan will be left out of his prison. So why hasn't his final judgment happened yet? Because now God's going to let him loose to tempt people who have not been tempted before. I used to think, who are those, who are those people? Well, the Bible says that not every Christian is going to die during the tribulation. There will be some who survive. 
and they will be in the thousand years with us as believers. And they're going to have kids. Those kids have not been tested. They've never had the opportunity to say yes or no for sin. So he's going to be out to tempt them because they've never had the opportunity to say yes or no to Christ's draw. So he's going to let them loose. And just like we have today, the people who were born during that time, a lot of them are going to rebel. Verse 8 says, he will go out, this is the devil, will go out and deceive the nations from every corner of the earth, which are called Gog and Magog. Now, when it says Gog and Magog, they're not talking about the nations per se. They're talking about they're going to be like Gog and Magog because Gog and Magog are already gone. This is the point where he's saying basically, yeah, it's going to be like it happened with that, those two nations, Gog and Magog. The nations that are rebelling against God have become kind of like Gog and Magog in the earlier years. So how did this happen? If there's a thousand years and no temptation, what, what's up with that? We answer this question, who originally gets into the thousand years? It's not us believers, because we're already dead and glorified and we're ruling with Christ. So who's there? Those are the people who survived the tribulation. They weren't killed and they're living during that thousand years of peace. God always has a remnant. And there's a remnant that's going to survive during the tribulation. And they're the ones who are going to live in those thousand years of peace. And these living believers now have children and grandchildren. It's been a thousand years. Now the Bible says they're going to live a lot longer. But you're still going to have children and grandchildren. Who've never had the opportunity to choose good. And it seems like the human heart will continue to be wicked even in a thousand years. Verses 8 and 9 says, He will gather them together for battle a mighty host, as, nu as numberless as sand on the shore. And I saw them as they went up of the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. So it sounds like the vast majority of people who were born during that time are going to rebel against God, just like it is today. And the city here is Jerusalem, and the enemy, which is the people who were tempted and, and succumbed to the devil's temptation, they're going to surround Jerusalem and, and want to attack it. So he's deceived a whole bunch of people, turned them against Christians that were living at this time. You have a thousand years of peace. But during the thousand years of peace, you know, there's three temptations, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil's not there, but there's still your flesh. There's still the temptations in the world. So you're going to have things that are tempting and just like we have today, Christians, we're tempted, but we have the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to say no, because the Bible says we're no longer slave to sin. And just like then, they're going to have the opportunity to say yes and no. Even the people who survived the tribulation will still have that temptation, their own fleshly temptation. And then their kids are going to rebel. And just like the Garden of Eden, where they lived without any evil influence, the minute the temptation was offered, they caved. Now, since believers are going to be ruling during this time, that means there's going to be laws, there's going to be justice, and it's going to happen quickly because there's still people and there's still humans. They still have their own temptations, so there's going to be laws. The Bible says we are going to be ruling. How do we rule unless there's a way to have justice and administer justice and have order? So there's going to be laws and regulations during that time, the thousand years, and we are going to rule, and it, the justice will happen quickly. Man's nature, in other words, the ones born after the believers got there, and the believers, that's our nature, we're still not able to follow the law. In the, in the thousand years, there's going to be laws, there's going to be regulations, and there's going to be people that break them because we're going to have to rule them, we're going to have to judge them, we're going to have to issue justice. That just tells you, no matter what God says and how much peace it is, we can't follow the law. We can't do everything right. If you think you're going to make it to heaven because you're a good person, no one, the Bible says, no one's good. We've all sinned. And imagine the people that live there did not appreciate the peace that they lived in. And they rebelled against God the minute the temptation came up. 
You might look at the news today and how many people who live here, and the majority of them are younger, but they don't appreciate what we have here. You know, go live somewhere else for, you know, a couple of years, and then tell me you don't appreciate. Well, that, that girl's basketball player, you know, hated America and was bound, didn't appreciate it. Okay, now she's in a country that doesn't have the freedoms we have here, and how's that working out for her? We need to appreciate what God has given us. But people don't. A perfect, I, the author says this, one commentary says this, a perfect environment cannot produce a perfect heart. If you have kids, as much as you try to prov provide a perfect environment for them, it doesn't guarantee they're going to have your heart. So these, all these unbelievers, all these people who were tested and failed, they're all amassing, they're all surrounding Jerusalem, getting ready to attack it. And just before they attack the city to wipe out the Christians, God stops it. He wipes them out. Verse 9 says, But fire came down from heaven on the attacking armies and consumed them. So now we have total destruction of the enemies of God. Everything's done. And finally, what we've been waiting for all of our life and all through the tribulation. Verse 10 says, Then the devil who betrayed them was thrown into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Yay. Yay. See, we do win. It seems like it takes forever, but we do win in the end. So God pretty much gathers up all the malcontents, or the devil promises all these people all these great things. He gets them around the city to, to attack it. But in reality, what he's doing, he's looking in to betray them. Because verse 10 says, then the devil who betrayed them. Think about it. Everything the devil wants to, you to do, every temptation you have, is not for your benefit. It's meant to betray you. The minute you're tempted to do something, the enemy is first... The first one there saying, oh, it's awesome, it's great, it's great, do it. And the minute you do it, he's the first one to condemn you for doing it. So don't give in. The enemy wants as much company in, in hell as he can get, and he wants the things that God loves to be destroyed. He can't, constri he can't destroy God. So what's he trying to do? Destroy what God loves, which is people. John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And everything the enemy does to us is an act of betrayal against you. The enemy always promises great things, but ultimately his desire is to betray and kill you. Destroy your life. And every time you think that a temptation comes along that's not that bad, think about it. Every temptation is designed to destroy you. And every time you give in to temptation, you are, you are siding with the one who wants to destroy you. So now the enemy is in the lake of fire where he does not rule, but he's being tormented day and night along with the Antichrist and the false prophet. So the three of them are there, and pretty much that's the only place that was designed only for them. It was only designed for them. And the enemy and the angels that left, that's who it was designed for. But ultimately, it's gonna, they're going to be joined by all those who rejected Christ. So we had the, the judgment seat of Christ at the beginning. Believers get the rewards or crowns and everything's good. So end of this thousand years, now they have the second judgment. And God raises up all the people who died without Christ. And verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne... And I saw the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the things written in the books, according to what they had done. The sea gave up their dead in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead in them. They were all judged according to their deeds. So this is the judgment for all those who have rejected Christ. They're kind of waiting 
in torment, but they're not in hell yet. So we see Jesus is the one on the throne, and Jesus is the one doing the judging. John 5.22 says, and the Father leaves all judgment to his, sin, to his Son. So Jesus is the one on the throne. He's the one that's going to look at the folks that are before him. And the Bible says the earth and sky fled, basically, and it says, leaving no place else to hide. That means the people who are before him, there's no place for them to hide. They, no place they can go to avoid the judgment that's coming upon them. And the Bible says the dead, both great and small. Those who were, who were there, they were great. They were powerful rulers. They were kings, leaders of nations, powerful people. So they're there and small, down to the lowliest peasant. All of them were brought before God to be judged. The Bible says if we live for this, only for this life, we're to be men most pitied because we're going to amass everything we want to here. But if you don't have a relationship with Christ, at this point, none of that stuff's going to matter. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. The devil was powerful. The beast and the false prophet were powerful. But at this point, you have nothing. You can't hide, and you're going to face judgment. Verse 13 says, The sea gave up their dead in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead in them. So that's everybody. Now, there's always some controversy about, you know, whether you're buried or cremated. I don't know, really, it doesn't really bother me that much because in either way, you're just speeding up the process. You're going to be dust or dirt, and God's going to fashion your body back up again, and you're going to stand before God in a body. And those who have rejected Christ are going to stand before God in a body and be judged. And verse 12 says, and the books were opened, including the book of life. So which books are, is he opening? Well, the first book is the Bible because this is how he's going to judge you by what is written in this book. Doesn't matter what anybody says to you, who you hear preaching to you, whatever sermons you've heard all your life, this is the judge. John 12, 48 says, but all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. So this is the, this is the Constitution. This is how we're all going to be judged, or the folks who know, don't know Christ are going to be judged. The second book will be the book of works. Now, there's three reasons for the book of works. To let people know that here's all your good works. Here's all the things you did. But I'm going to show you that they're not enough. The second reason is to show them that they've rejected Jesus by thinking that their good works are enough. And by doing that, they've actually followed Satan and not Christ. What's the Bible say that he said to the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. The third reason is to determine the degree, to the degree of punishment that they will receive. They will receive. Everyone will be judged by the light that they've received. Not all of hell is the same. There are degrees of punishment in hell. Now, the best place in hell is horrible, but there are going to be degrees of punishment. Matthew eleven twenty two says, I assure you, Tyre and Sidon, what, will be better off on the judgment day than you. So there's differing degrees of punishment. 20, eleven twenty four says, I assure you, Sodom will be better off on the judgment day than you. So again, a different, different type of judgment. Luke twelve forty seven, the servant will be punished severely for though he knew his duty, he refused to do it. But people who are not aware that they are doing wrong will be punished only lightly. Much is required from them for those to whom much is given, and much more is required for those from those to whom much more is given. So, if you've heard the gospel numerous times and you've rejected it, you've had all kinds of light. You'll be judged harsher because you, you know and people ask you, what about the guy in deepest, darkest Africa who's never heard the gospel? Well, Romans 1 says this. If you walk outside of your house and you look at nature, you can do one of two things. Either worship nature or worship the God who made nature. And if you worship the God who made nature, God's going to reveal to you who that is. But if you worship the nature of the things you see, then you've made your choice based on the light you have. 
Now, as believers, all of our sins are blotted out. Gone, right? And the Bible says we'll all die probably with unconfessed sin. So unless you're on your deathbed and you're able to ask for forgiveness, as Christians, we're going to die with unconfessed sin. Car wreck, heart attack, whatever it might be. We're not going to have time to confess the latest sin. But they're all been blotted out. However, they're not blotted out for those who haven't accepted Christ. They're all going to be in this book. The deeds, not only good deeds, but the bad deeds. Luke 8, 17 says, For everything that is hidden or secret will eventually be brought to light and made plain to all. Verse 14 and 15 says, And death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death, the lake of fire. So when you, bring, when you are standing before God and he opens the books, he's going to say, okay, you think you can make it on your own and by your good works. Let's see what you did. And just to remind you that perfection is my standard, God says. If you have one sin, you can't make it. And so you open the books, you look at the books, and, and instantly you're going to show one sin. Okay, doesn't matter what the rest of it is. You've already sinned. You've chosen to ignore me, so that's... We go by your standard. You think works are enough. They're not. So you're going to go in the lake of fire. Now when it says death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire, the NIV says Hades. Hades, in, or Sheol was the Hebrew, that's the place of the dead. Now I think I've said this before. In the Old Testament times, up until Jesus, there's this compartment. It's called Sheol or Hades. It's one, one area, but two compartments. There's the paradise side and there's the punishment side, the torment side. When you have Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man dies, Lazarus goes to be with Jesus, they, they can see each other, or at least Lazarus can see, the, you know, the rich man can see Lazarus. So they're in the same area. But Jesus says, you can't cross over, you know, you're not going to make it. When Jesus died, he took the keys and he took the paradise side with him to heaven. The punishment side is still there still in a place called Hades. They're all in torment right now, just like the, the rich man in Luke 16. In fact, Luke 16 says, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. So he's able to see Lazarus. He's able to see the, the greatness over there. He's able to realize the punishment he has. And so Jesus took the paradise side that leaves Hades still there with the punishment side. And so when Jesus says death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire, that's what he means. That compartment is now thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. Born once, die twice. Since there is no more sin, there will be no more death. So what? Death itself is also cast into the fire. Verse 15 says, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was also thrown into the lake of fire. So he brings out the books of deeds, reads all the deeds of the guys, and they realize their judgment. And he says, just to make it sure, let me read to you, let me see if I can find your name in the book of life. Opens the book of life, guess what? Name's not there. It goes into hell. Now, recently... Some Christians have tried to downplay hell and either it doesn't exist or when you die as an unbeliever, you just cease to exist. They call that annihilationism. The Bible's plain in so many areas that hell's real and people will go there if they reject Christ. God never sugarcoats it. So we need to understand what really is at, at stake. Do you understand what's at stake? You ever burn yourself? You burn yourself. How much pain that is. Just for a little part of your body, for a little bit of time. Can you imagine what hell was like? I can't imagine. You're basically on fire for eternity. And you know what you have in hell? You have memory. You remember... The rich man, rich man in Lazarus, he remembered. He remembered he had a family. He remembered 
the beggar, he remembered stuff. You're going to remember every time you had the choice to follow Christ or not. And you're going to remember all the times that people witnessed to you. And you're going to remember the things that you left behind that maybe you could have made an influence on. I'll close with this. I heard a, and I've probably said this before, an atheist said, you know, I can't believe that there's a hell. I can't believe it. Because if it was true, and I knew people that weren't saved, I would crawl across broken glass to tell them about it so they would avoid it. He said, I don't see that happening. And I think sometimes we, as Christians, we forget the severity of what hell is going to be like. Jesus never did. He made it pretty plain. And Revelation tells us what's going to happen to those who don't believe. And we've been praying for folks. And God does miracles. God does great things. And I, I love the time of prayer we have. But God does all that so other people can see what God's doing in our life. So we have a testimony. Hey, God healed me last Sunday. Or God did this to me during the week. You share that. That's your testimony. And people want to know about it and they may come to hear the gospel. And they may come to the Franklin Graham thing, whatever. But it gives you an open door to talk about what God is doing for you. They may not believe this, but if they're your friend, they're probably going to believe what you tell them, that this is what God did for me. I can't speak for anybody else. This is what God did for me. That's a testimony. When you go to testify in court, all you do is you tell them what you saw. When you talk to someone about Christ, you tell them what you know about what God's done for me. And they either believe you or they don't. And if they're your friend, they're going to believe you. Or at least be open to the idea that, man, something supernatural is happening in their life. And they're going to want to know more. And God's going to use that to bring him to Christ. Would you stand as we close this morning? Would you bow your heads for a moment? You know, God's word has given us great and precious promises, it says. Things that God wants us to enjoy while we're here. Promises that God answers prayer. All the things that make living right now exciting and expectatious and just believing that that God is working supernaturally in our life. And for that, we are eternally grateful and we appreciate everything but everything that God blesses us with now is only temporary your healing is only temporary your provision is only temporary what is eternal is what matters and God gives us the temporary to encourage us for the eternal If you're here this morning, you've never really accepted Christ. You've never really asked God to forgive you of your sin because we're all sinners. And as we read the books, no one is righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. But the Bible says the wage of the, those sin is death. That's the second death. However, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can have eternal life by simply believing the fact that Christ died for you because you are a sinner. And he's made you right with God. If that's you and you want to make that choice right now, because the choice is yours, God's not going to make you do it. But the Bible says if you're thinking about God, it's because God's making you think about him. And God's trying to make you make the choice, but he's not going to do it for you. If that's you, make the choice. Raise your hand because I want to pray with you. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you saved us, Lord. Your word says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we wanted nothing to do with you, you still saved us. If you never do anything else for us, Lord, you saved us for eternity. And you spared us hell for eternity. And Father, for that For that alone, we worship you and we glorify you and say you're worthy and we thank you.
but we also thank you for how you've promised to be with us in this life. We give the battle to you. We expect a miracle. And we believe that a miracle is in the works. That you're working out something to bring more glory to your name. And we just want to be a, a part of what you're doing. So Lord, I pray you'd fill everyone here with your Holy Spirit. Give us your divine wisdom, your divine direction. Put us in situations that allow us to bring glory to your name, whether by witnessing or living or whatever it is we're doing. We want to receive the rewards you have for us. And the Bible says it's okay to want those rewards. So Lord, I pray your blessings upon each one here today. Allow them to experience you personally, not just through a sermon, Lord, but them personally in their prayer room, when they're reading, meet them where they are and let them know you love them today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Don't forget, sign up for the picnic. It's next Sunday. We're not going to be here next Sunday. We're going to be at Brookside Park. If you need directions, don't call me. <laughs>